Hey everybody, my name's Paige and I am the Creative Arts Manager at Grace Church Barberton. We are so glad you're listening to our Sunday service podcast. This is the live recording of our Sunday message and we hope you are so encouraged, challenged, and energized by what you hear. Let's jump into our new series, Follow Me, A Journey Through Luke. Well, thank you. Thanks, everybody. So good to be here. Joel, I don't think you prepared me for what I was going to experience here. This is like over the top. So I, I really appreciate you all, and it's good to be here. Uh, so like, I, like Joel said, my name's Charles. Uh, thanks for having me here this morning. It's great to be here. Uh, it's a privilege. I've actually, like Pastor Joel said, been working with him. We'll grab some coffee, just been talking about uh, kind of what's going on here, the series that we're in. And I'm really excited. I've really been pumped up these last couple weeks that I've been, as I've been preparing today. And I'm excited to share uh, something with you guys that God has put on my heart, right? As we've been kind of going through this, there's some things that uh, God's been doing inside me that really that's what I'm going to share with you guys all today. So I'm really excited. And I got good news. If it's your first time here, it's my first time here too. So <laughs> it was funny. In the lobby, I was talking to someone as they were walking in and they were just saying, oh, hey, you know, it's, it's their first time. And I was like, I got great news. I gave her a hug. I'm like, it's my first time here too. So so we're kind of on the same uh, playing field here, but I'm actually really pumped up. Like, it's getting me really fired up um, just to be with you guys. I'm really excited. Um, so thanks for having me here. Uh, just like uh, Pastor Joel said, uh, I'm actually part of the Grace family, too. Uh, we're all part of one big, you know, Grace Church. Uh, we do have a few different locations, and I'm uh, right down the road, and I'm a resident there at our Bath campus. So basically what that means is I'm trained to become a pastor. And experiences like this give me reps and give me uh, just some wisdom from sitting down with Joel to kind of figure out what that's going to look like. So I'm very grateful uh, just to be here, be able to gain some experience even myself. But a little bit uh, about myself, so you know a little bit about me. I grew up in Akron, so kind of on the same playing field there. And I graduated from Copley High School. So just down the road, there it is. I don't know if there's any Copley grads here, but that's a little bit about me. Um, I decided to follow Jesus the summer before my senior year of high school. So that's when uh, Jesus really clicked for me. Uh, I really wasn't exactly sure what it meant, uh, what Jesus was until then. So that's when it really clicked. And since then, I've just been trying to figure out what exactly it means to follow Jesus and uh, to give my all to him. And like I said, I'm a resident at Grace. So if you want to hang out with me on Tuesday nights, every Tuesday night, I'm at our Norton campus right down the road for about three and a half hours on a Tuesday night. So that's kind of the seminary track. That's kind of what I do. Um, so that's a little bit about my schooling. I also have been married for about a year and a half to an amazing woman named Lauren. So you might have seen her walking in or, or with me, and you're like, I don't know how he got a, a beautiful woman like that. And I don't know either, but, you know, um, God's good, and uh, we're here. And, uh, yeah, so we made it. Uh, fortunately, the rings is a great thing. But uh, something we love to do is we love the outdoors. We love whether it's hiking, whether it's backpacking, camping, kind of fill in the blank. We love being outside. We love crazy adventures. That's a little bit about what we do. Um, so it's really fun. But like I mentioned today, uh, I'm just excited to be here, excited to share some things God's been teaching me. Um, but yeah, over the last handful of weeks, we've been in the series called Follow Me. And what we've said is following me is an identity, not just an activity. And uh, who you are following is who you're becoming. Who you're following is who you're becoming. So in week one, uh, Pastor Joel kind of kicked us off and said, following Jesus is an invitation to see Jesus. Uh, week two, he said, following Jesus is an invitation to the sick. And week three, he said, following Jesus is following his leadership. And week four, he said, following Jesus is an invitation of blessing. But today, I want to talk about something a little bit crazy. So bear with me here. It might kind of ruffle some feathers, but I'm excited. That's what Jesus does a lot. Um, but following Jesus is loving your enemies. So we're going to go to this, uh, this passage. I just want to look at this verse real quick. Uh, here's what it says in Luke 6, 27. It says Jesus is talking uh, to some of the, his followers, some people who would have uh, been his disciples. And he says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. And I gave you the warning, right, that Jesus is radical. He's going to say some things that you're going to be like, okay, I don't know about that. So I just want to say, hey, bear with me. We're going to have a good conversation. We're going to kind of unpack this a little bit, kind of figure out what this means. But I do want to say uh, one of the reasons I'm not here, 
I'm not here to just help you guys become a better person. Uh, I don't want you to leave here today just thinking you have to pull up your bootstraps and uh, just like, all right, I got to love my enemies. I just kind of got to deal with it and get together and just be a good guy. I want to talk to you about Jesus. I want to talk to you about one of the things that Jesus says and something that he calls us to do if we're a follower of Jesus. And like I said, I'm going to warn you a little bit, uh, following Jesus is uh, pretty radical. He, uh, he's going to teach as he normally does. And every time Jesus teaches, uh, he says some things that go against the, the flow of our lives. So I'm excited we're going to unpack this a little bit. And um, uh, yeah, when you're tracking, I want you to consider what, what he's saying. So if you're not a follower of Jesus, just want you to consider, hey, what is he saying and why is he saying it? But before we jump in, I want to share with you guys a story a little bit. So I did say I like adventures, right? So uh, a big part of my life, like I said, is I like to travel. I like to do adventures. And this is a story from before I was married. So before I was married, I had to really uh, struggle to find people to go on adventures with me. I had to like convince people. I'm like, dude, it's like worth the, the gas money to go do this. I was like, it's worth your time. So uh, one of my friends uh, kind of had that adventure bug inside of him too. So what we decided to do is we decided to go on an adventure together. And uh, he actually had this idea. He's like, there's this place in Indiana. It's called Indiana Dunes. Have you heard of that before? It might, you might have heard of Sleeping Dunes, uh, Sleeping Bear Dunes, maybe in Michigan. But this is in uh, Indiana, and it's right on Lake Michigan. And it's gorgeous. Like, you're like, I don't know how this is a great lake. This seems like a tropical place. It was just gorgeous. So um, he ended up convincing me to go. And he said, uh, hey, you know, we can do whatever we want there. He said, we can camp. He said, uh, we can hike. He said, we can get in the water. We can do whatever and just run up these dunes, whatever we want to do. And I was like, dude, you got me. Like, I'm in. So uh, someone he went to school with, their parents had a place in Fort Wayne. So it's about a four and a half hour drive. So we kind of um, hopped in his car and we drove up there. Um, it was my car, actually, which is important for the story. We'll get to that in a second. Um, but we hopped in my car and we drove up there. We ended up getting there probably about three hours to get to Fort Wayne or something like that. And uh, we ended up spending the night there. And then we woke up pretty much first thing in the morning. His friend's parents, you know, cooked us breakfast. They were, they were great. And um, so we drove up there, and we got there, and it was gorgeous. It was kind of like everything that you saw in the pictures, right? It was like the crystal blue waters. Uh, the sun was shining, nothing like this. And uh, it was just awesome. So we're, he's a runner, and I'm like, I like to run and be adventurous. I'm like, all right, we're just going to run up these dunes and just hike them all, and it was great. It was the best. We had such a good time. And uh, we're sitting on the dunes, and we're just looking at the water, and we're like, oh, it's so gorgeous. You can kind of see uh, this place uh, to the right. I forget what it's called. Um, but basically, it's like uh, there were tons of like uh, big buildings, big companies with the smokestacks. It's like super gross. Um, if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. But on the other side, if on a clear day, you can actually see like uh, Chicago, if it's clear. And w him and I were sitting there, we were thinking, we're like, Chicago. Like, we made it this far. I think Chicago is only like an hour and a half, two hours away from here. We're like, what if we did it? What if we just like left Indiana Dunes early and just drove over to Chicago? So we were like thinking about this. We're like, all right, what are we going to do? And we ended up doing it. So we got into my car. We drove to Chicago. And the second we like were on our way there, there was tons of traffic. So if you've ever been to Chicago, like, I don't know. I'm not excited to go back again. But... Um, but we're like, all right, let's do that. We're like, we want to get that deep dish Chicago pizza. Like, there's something about, like, a deep dish. I'm like, we have to do this. So we're, we end up driving out there, and we get there. We overpay for parking. It was like $40. I was like, I knew I made a mistake. And there was traffic. And we probably overpaid for the pizza. It's funny because it was uh, Giordano's, but they just put one of those in North Canton. So <laughs> I don't know how special it is. Uh, but we were really pumped about it. So uh, we end up driving down there, and we get there. We have the pizza, and it's great. And towards the end, we hop back in the car, and we're headed uh, back home. But we don't have a place to stay that night. So uh, with the additional trip to Chicago, it added about an hour and a half. So we were looking at about six hours to get home. Now, if you know anything about Chicago traffic, you know that uh, towards the evening, uh, six hours becomes a lot longer. <laughs> so we're sitting in standstill traffic. Wow, that was close. We're sitting in standstill traffic, and um, I'm like, yeah, it's going to be a long time. You know, the GPS keeps going up and up. And um, I'm normally the type of guy who wants to drive no matter the cost. Like, unless I am actively falling asleep behind the wheel, I, I want to drive. So um, I told him I wanted to drive. So we're driving out, and I get to this point where I'm exhausted. Like, the sun's going down. I'm like, it is not safe for me to drive. 
I look over at my friend. I'm like, hey, would you drive? He's like, yeah, for sure. I was like, I just need to fall asleep. Give me like 15 minutes, quick cat nap, and I'll, I'll be back up. So we did that. And uh, uh, so I'm laying down in the passenger seat. I'm kind of reclined back, trying to get some shut eye real quick. And I wake up to uh, looking out the window and seeing my good friend flying down the highway. Like we're on 30 and we're going like 90 plus. This is my car. I, the, the car had um, like a speed. I don't, some cars have like a speed, uh, like limiter, it'll beep at you if you're going too fast. And it was at, set at 90 and it was going off. And I'm like, what is happening? So I'm like, dude, you need to slow down. And, but he was like, ah, I'm okay. And so I kind of just fell back asleep. And, uh, but I ended up waking up and he is like aggressively driving around this other car. I'm like, what is happening? Why? And um, basically what happened was the one car sped up pretty fast and got behind him. He didn't like it. Maybe he was slowing down. And he's the type of guy who's like, no, 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 no. Don't you dare try and pass me. Don't be aggressive with me. So he like zooms in front of him. And then he's like not letting them pass. I'm like, what is happening? I'm like screaming at him. I'm like, dude, why are you making this car like your enemy? Like you were literally like, it's you and this car versus this car. This car is your enemy. And you were like fighting against it. So I get super frustrated with him. I'm like, dude, what's the big deal? Like, why are you getting so upset? Why is this car all of a sudden your enemy and why are you acting like this? So all that being said, I made him pull over and um, basically screamed at him. and was like, dude, don't ever do that by car again. I did say sorry because I was a little aggressive, but I do think it's really interesting how uh, so quickly this other car became his enemy and the way he interacted with them was really fascinating. And uh, I'm sure this story sounds familiar. Some of you guys probably on your way to church made some enemies uh, as you drove here uh, a little late, but um, that's okay uh, because you made it here and we're good. Um, but it's really fascinating. If you were, as a kid, you might have heard this growing up. If someone hits you, hit them back, right? You heard that philosophy, if someone hit, hits you, hit them back. It's, it's so interesting. I think we're like wired like from birth to like create the people who are on our team and enemies. I think it's really fascinating. There's another part of our culture today that's uh, known as like cancel culture. So you might be familiar with that. If there's someone who posts something online that you don't like, you just like write them off and uh, you just like uh, tear them apart, really. You create enemies with it. Uh, well, as a generation, we are more passionate about issues related to justice than ever, which is a big deal. Um, God's passionate about justice. But how do we think about the other side or the other people on the side of the fence? How do we interact with other people? Uh, God is passionate about justice. Like the Bible says that one day uh, Jesus will bring justice and he'll make everything right again. There'll be no more injustices ever again. But how do we interact with people we don't get along with, people we consider enemies? Another way that this shows up is uh, the political polarization. Uh, I mean, you, you think about it, no matter what side you'd be on, right? Jesus probably wouldn't be on either side. Um, we don't just disagree, we sometimes hate other people. Uh, think about whenever you're uh, driving next to someone with a bumper sticker you don't get along with. What's like your natural inclination? This thing is really fascinating to think through. And I was thinking about all these ideas together, and I think the general consensus is we're wired to love the people who are on our team and hate the people who aren't. Love the people who are for us and hate the people who aren't. Why would you love someone if they don't care about you at all? Uh, if they're not for you, forget about them. So why do we do this? I was trying to think about this. I was like, okay, we're so wired to do this. That's kind of wanted to sh that's why I wanted to share. It. Our natural inclination is to do this, but why is it like that? Um, have you ever thought about that? I think it actually makes sense because we've all been hurt by many people, whether it's recently, whether it's sometime in the past, we've been hurt by many people. Uh, and our enemies are often people who are against us. Like that's a fair thing to say. Uh, whether it's this person or these people or someone I love who has hurt me, our enemies are often hate us, and uh, we get scared, right? If we're like, if they're not for me, I have to defend for myself somehow. If we don't stand for ourselves, who will, right? Have you ever thought that, ever thought through that? What's really fascinating is in Jesus' day, it was the same exact way. Uh, I kind of nerded out about this for a second, but there was a document that was found written within 100 years of Jesus' life. And it's a, kind of a scroll. They found it. It's an ancient document. And it contained like a set of religious uh, regulations ordering the members of this community group on how to live in this community. So it was like their law, their community guidelines. And uh, the English translation of what was written says, at Qumran, the place where it was written, one was to love all the sons of light, fellow members of the sect, 
and hate the sons of darkness, people who weren't a part of the sect. Love the people who are for you, hate the people who aren't. Does that sound familiar? It's interesting, that same uh, thought process continued from Jesus' day and even is today. So what do we do with this? Uh, Jesus is going to do something crazy with it. He's going to flip the script a little bit, and uh, it's going to make us a little uncomfortable, so fair warning, and I think this is really hard to do. But I'm excited. We're going to tear it apart and talk about it today. And here's what he says. So we're going to look at this passage in Luke 6. Uh, what he says, he's talking to some people who were already his followers, talking to his disciples, people who like kind of agreed and said, I want to be on team Jesus, I want to follow Jesus. And he gives directions for how to act as followers of Jesus. He's not given like commands like, you have to do this to be my follower. He's kind of showing them, if you want to be my follower um, and you want to be serious about it, why don't you do these things because that's what I do. So Jesus is going to say some wild things. So it'll be up on the screen for you too. Like I said, we're in Luke 6. If you want to follow along, you can just Google Luke 6 and it'll come right up. Um, but if you want to follow along on the screens, you can do that too. So I'm going to read a handful of these verses. Luke 6, 27 through 36. Here it is. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from who you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting anything back, then your reward will be great, and you'll be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. So what is Jesus doing here? And he's teaching his people who are already his followers a new way of living. He's showing his followers that they can live a different way. And I think it's really interesting. I don't think it's complicated. Like whenever we're reading this passage, this isn't one where you're like trying to go back and you're like trying to figure it all out. Here's what Jesus says on how to live this new way of life to his followers. He says, love your enemies. Love your enemies. He says, do good to those who hate you. Has someone ever uh, done something nice to you after you didn't do something nice to them, after you hurt them or something like that, you say mean comments, maybe like your spouse or uh, one of your good friends, and you say something that's like really mean, and they respond and they're like uh, very nice. And you're like, ooh, I actually wanted you to like be mad at me so like I'd feel better about myself, but that's not how it worked. Jesus also says, bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you, which is really fascinating, that prayer one, because prayer does a bunch of things for us. But one of the things that prayer does whenever we pray for someone we don't like, it actually reorients our heart. It actually reorients our heart. It's really powerful. So Jesus continues, and uh, what does it look like? Like, what does he, he gives explanations on how to love your enemies and what that looks like. And here's what it says. If someone slaps you, turn to them the other cheek also. If someone takes your coat, offer them your shirt. Give to everyone who asks. If someone takes, do not demand it back. And the golden rule, right? Do to others as you would have them do to you. And what does this communicate? I think Jesus is trying to help his people be set apart and make them different because no one does this. Like if you do any of this to anyone who you like don't know, who doesn't know you, they will kind of be super weirded out. That's like the person, uh, that's like if uh, my one friend who was driving in the car, the person who like he kind of cut off and was like blocking in, really bad. Um, But if that person just like was super cool with it and was like, you know what, Uh, he's probably having a bad day or he's probably exhausted, like, whenever we respond with niceness, that translates something so different. Jesus kind of gives a commentary on what he's saying, and it'll be on the screen, this next part. Here's what it says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? That's easy, right? It's easy to love those who love you. If someone does something nice, you're like, yeah, I'll give them something back. And even sinners, sinners this just means like people who don't follow Jesus love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those who expect (coughs) repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. If you love those who love you, that's easy. 
He says in other places, uh, Jesus says that his followers are supposed to be set apart. That like whenever people look at Jesus' people who claim the name of Jesus, who follow Jesus, he's like, you guys are supposed to look different. And that's what he's trying to get them to see. And one of the biggest ways is loving your enemies. So here's what you might be thinking whenever you read this passage. Jesus, you seem pretty insensitive. Ever think, like, I mean, it's kind of a bold claim, but some of us are honestly think that. You say, you don't get me, Jesus. You don't know how much I've been wronged. You don't know how much I've been wronged. And um, there's, there's a caveat to this I, I wanted to make sure to share because um, sometimes there is abusive situations and um, like Jesus doesn't think that's okay. And um, we're here as your church to kind of come around you and just talk with you and help you through that. This, is, this isn't Jesus condoning abusive situations. But what G- this is Jesus doing is helping us love our enemies, our people who uh, we disagree with or who um, we tend to not get along with. So people like that, right, you, you might be saying, Jesus, you don't get um, my ex who did this. Jesus, you don't get this person wronged me. Um, and Jesus would say, you know, that's all true. And I actually, I know that. Like Jesus would empathize with you and say, I do understand that entirely. He's not saying it's okay. Jesus would say as his son or daughter, right? Jesus says that uh, we are God's children. And it's not okay. He doesn't want that ever to happen to you. But he loves you so much. Um, he doesn't want you to get caught up in all the hatred that insinuates and follows that. He, doesn't, he says you can be freed from that. You don't have to be stuck in the hate because of who Jesus is and who he says we are. It's not because he doesn't get us. It's because he gets us more than we get ourselves. And Jesus is our advocate. Jesus will bring justice. I mentioned that earlier. And is teaching us to live like we know what he says to be true. Here's, here's a point that I wanted to toss on the screen is that Jesus knows that we have been wronged. He knows that friend in high school, college, that friend who just stabbed you in the back last week, he knows that. He knows that people group of the people who identify in that group have hurt people in your family, people like you, or you can kind of fill in the blank there. He knows about that family member who you have to spend all this time fighting with or trying to forgive or get along with. And Jesus is for us, is here for us in, in our pain. He doesn't say that it's okay that you've been wronged. He knows what it's like to be wronged which is really fascinating, that on the cross, Jesus was deserted, he was abandoned, he was wronged, he was the most wrong, he was wrongfully accused and hung on a cross. And because he was wrong, he had all the reason to make the people who put him on the cross his enemies. But here's what he says to the people who put him on the cross. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people who put him on the cross, Jesus prays for them and says, Father, forgive them. The next point is that Jesus loves us so deeply and wants us to be able to experience his love that it makes all the pain we have experienced seem a small shadow. What Jesus is calling us to is actually only to love as we've been loved. He wants us to experience that love that makes all the hurt in perspective. He wants us to reflect how he acted to others, how he's been acted to us to others. And this is nearly impossible to do without Jesus. If you ever try loving your enemies um, without Jesus, you have zero motivation to. The second, maybe you're okay like one time, like you're like, okay, I'll, you know, I'll forgive you. You know, I feel like that's a good thing to do. Um, and then they act like a jerk back again. And you're like, it kind of runs dry. You're like, I'm kind of at my limits here. Like I'm kind of maxed out. And I don't think you can love your enemies without Jesus. Here's a, a third point, which I think is a really big deal, is that we follow a greater king. In Luke 6, 35 through 36, here's what it says. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you'll be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Because we follow a greater king, we can interact with our enemies in a completely different way. We can trust that God is in control and that he's also just and that he will bring justice and we can trust that he has it all in his hands. And when we do this, Jesus says something really interesting in this passage. He says our reward will be great, not just here on earth 
our eyes are often so fixed and focused on what's on earth, but Jesus is trying to get us to look and see something that there's so much bigger. There's something else in the future that's coming. He offers us a future reward. So what's the alternative? What's the alternative if we don't accept the reward and love of our enemies? I kind of mentioned this earlier. We can kind of get kind of stuck in the cycle of hatred. It's like, it's pretty, it's pretty rough. It's super draining. We can get very worked up. You've probably been in that situation. My friend, when he was driving, he was not happy. He was like pretty frustrated. And uh, the fact that I was yelling at him did not help. But, but it does get super draining and it gets, you kind of get so worked up in it. Verse 35 says, you'll prove to be children of the most high. God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Jesus is just and he's also merciful. And the invitation is to identify with him. The invitation is to identify with him. So when we do what Jesus has done to us, God looks at us and sees himself. He's like, that's what I did. And he sees us and we're able to reciprocate that to others. And he shows mercy to those who do not deserve it. Right? The Father shows mercy to us. So anytime we fall short of what God wants for us, whether we hurt someone else or we sin against God, he knows this and he wants us to show mercy to other people because he shows mercy to us when we do that. Even when we make God our enemy, he loves us. It's really, really interesting. And he'd be completely just, if you think about it, if he wanted to just spite us immediately, you know, kind of like bring down fire or whatever you're, you know, in your head, the cartoon version of that is. But that's not what he does. That's not who he is. He shows us mercy instead. Because God is, God is just, but also a merciful God. And what he's asking us to do if you're a follower of Jesus is to just extend that to others, to show others who God is. Jesus knew that there was nothing we could do to save ourselves from making God our enemy and what is best for us. He knew that. He knew that uh, he had to show us mercy, even though we often make an enemy of who God is all the time. Jesus, who is the king, right? If Jesus is the creator of the universe, he, we would call him the king, and um, he wants to establish what he calls like his kingdom, that all of his followers would kind of live under how he created them to. And he came to earth to show us mercy, even though we didn't deserve it. And oftentimes, we've disregarded God in the way that he's shown us his mercy, and not only has Jesus wronged us, or not only have we wronged Jesus, but we often personally are the ones who continually do that. So it's any time we choose something over Jesus or something against what we ask him, we're the ones who, are, who wronged him, yet he is merciful. And we constantly live in that mercy. So back to that story, back to the one, uh, my friend who was driving in that car, um, Oftentimes, we do that to God. We'll kind of be driving, and for some reason, God's just kind of um, next to us because God never leaves us. And all of a sudden, we'll kind of like cut, over, cut in front of God and be like, all right, God, I got it. I got it. And sometimes, you know, God's not going at the pace we want, or we get frustrated with God, and, you know, we'll hop in the left-hand lane, kind of flip him the bird. You know, something like that. You know, no, we might not actually do that, but that's like the, the way that we interact with God. And Sometimes it's just because we get caught up and we miss out and we kind of don't understand what exactly um, God is calling us to or how to follow him. But here's the thing. Whenever we disregard God, whenever we make God our enemies, he doesn't catch back up to us, ride our tail, right, and try to run you off the road. God doesn't do that. That's not who his character is. He's merciful and he extends that mercy to us. Loving our enemies is just believing what Jesus says to be true about himself, and about us. And I, as I was preparing for this message, um, I was kind of thinking about how this applies to my life. Because uh, whenever I do stuff like this, like God personally like, works inside my heart and shows me some places I need to, um, that I haven't given up to him. And um, this is super hard for me. Like this whole conversation, I'm very justice focused. And you might, if you, my friends would really laugh at this. Um, and I'm struggling, someone who struggles with loving my enemies so much. If someone wrongs me, I feel like I know right from wrong. Like, I'm pretty confident. Like, if someone, I'm like, you know, if someone cuts me off, that's like kind of the same playing field, like, they did that to me, so that's not right. Um, I tend to roll with the philosophy an eye for an eye. I think the exact same that Jesus taught against. Um, 
But uh, if someone treats me wrong, I wouldn't necessarily say anything back to them. Like, I'm not the one who's going to dish it out on the side of the road or start screaming at you outside my window. But what I will do is I will mumble to myself or to my wife, which in Jesus' eyes is the same exact thing. So one side isn't really better than the other. And it's really challenging. Especially, like, I mean, you can kind of put your own example, but for me, I always think about this, like, customer service-wise, right? You go up to the Walmart, check out, um, or something like that, you go to return something, and someone doesn't necessarily treat you how you expect to be treated. I expect to be treated pretty highly, um, which the Lord has really helped me bring down. Uh, but often, I get really frustrated with that. And I struggle to show that mercy to people that God has asked me to do. Um, and the reason I do that is because I forget how much mercy God has shown me. I forget how much mercy that God has shown me and how on the daily basis, I'm the one who doesn't love God um, entirely uh, with my whole heart and follow him and never make a mistake or never sin. It's really fascinating. So I don't have any good story about myself doing this well, but I do have a story of a guy in the Bible. And this guy's name is Stephen and um, he really, he's like the champion of, of this. He did everything that Jesus said, at least in this story. I'm sure he had his mistakes too. Um, but he was like, I want to love my enemies. He's like, I am confident and I just want to do what God has called me to do. So I want to look at this guy. His name's, like I said, his name's Stephen. It's a story in the Bible. He was a follower of Jesus during the really early days of being a Christian. Um, and he was actually accused of blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So basically what that meant was um, saying things that weren't true about God. And in that culture, like if you were to do that, like that was like a capital offense. Like that was like, you're in trouble for that. But what's really fascinating, he wasn't being blasphemous. He was actually being faithful and listening to God. But here's what happened to him. We're going to look at this. He was, uh, they took Stephen, had him stand in front of this religious leaders and this council. And they questioned him. And he, but here's what Stephen did. He actually spoke what God told them to, the truth about what the Bible says and who God was and God's words that he wanted to tell the religious leaders. And here's what happened after Stephen told the religious leaders about what God said. We'll pick it up. It's in Acts 7, 54. It'll be right on the screens here. When the members of the Sanhedrin, that's that religious leader group, heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen full of the Holy Spirit, looked up into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. There's so much in here. But I can't think of a more real, honest, and beautiful picture of what it looks like to love your enemies than when people who are wrongfully killing you, you're like the, you know, Stephen wasn't perfect. But in this situation, in this story, we see that he didn't do anything wrong. He prayed for the people who were murdering him just like Jesus did. On the cross, Jesus prayed for the people who were murdering him. And when Jesus was put on the cross, he prayed for the people, like I said, who were murdering him. And Stephen does the same exact thing. Another thing I want you to notice is Stephen was full of the Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit, which is really fascinating. I think all that, that means was he, he spent time with Jesus. He knew Jesus' heart. He knew his mind. And he had a comfort knowing that who God was, that amidst him being stoned, he had a confidence that Jesus was the king and that he was in Jesus' kingdom. The third, the third thing about Stephen's story is he literally does what Jesus said. He prayed for those who mistreat you. He literally did it in this situation. He's praying for those people. And guys, this is a powerful example of what Jesus uh, told Stephen to do, and he's literally doing it. The stoning communicated so much, right? Because it's one thing to murder an innocent person. It's one thing to do that, which speaks so much volume. It's another for Stephen to pray for the people who are murdering him. That's crazy. This communicates so much 
about who Jesus is and how they can live as a follower of Jesus. So what do we do with this conversation today? What do we do with it? I don't want to invite you just to love your enemies as a good idea or a new fad because it's going to run dry by Tuesday at noon, honestly. Um, But what I want to do is I want you to experience Jesus' love and mercy so you can love your enemies as you've been loved. Because people are going to wrong you, right? Your enemies are going to continue, even other Christians. And we are all in a broken world, it happens. But because of the unchanging nature of who God is, we can love our enemies through that. So the band's going to come up. But if you're here and not a follower of Jesus, I want you to consider a Jesus who is merciful and loving so that you can love your enemies and show mercy to other people. And if you do not know him or never experienced his mercy, I want you to invite you to experience that. And I will be honest here, some Christians might not have shown you mercy. Most of the time, because we're all humans, that might have been your experience. And I just want to say that that's not Jesus' heart. That's just, the, that's just our human nature. We're working on it. And if you're a follower of Jesus, I want you to do the same thing. Consider the love and mercy that God extended to you. Whenever we do not love as we've been loved, it's just often that we forget. We forget how much God has loved us and shown us mercy. But we want to continue to draw near to Jesus. We want to be like Stephen who is full of the Spirit and be connected to Jesus and allow him to open our hearts and show us how much he's extended mercy and love to us. We're the ones who fly by God, remember? We're the ones who are on the road, just like my one friend. We're the ones who fly by God. But like I say, he doesn't catch up and try and get on our tail. He's merciful. So as I pray, I want to ask God to open up our hearts to how loving and how merciful he is. Jesus, Lord, thank you that you're loving and merciful to us. God, in... uh, Yeah, we don't deserve it, Lord. There's nothing that we've done and um, we deserve, Lord, but you're so good and that's who you are. You extend us mercy um, just because you're good and that's who you are. God, so we cling to that. um, Allow that to be the truth in our hearts. Lord, help us find that. Help us figure out what that means and what you've done for us. God, so thank you for who you are. Help us continue to trust in you. And help uh, who you are just be motivation to love other people as you've loved us. In your name, amen. Thanks for joining us this week. If you'd like to reach out and connect with us or hear more about Grace Church, you can head to barberton.gracechurches.org for more information. We meet in person at 1030 a.m. on Sunday mornings at 629 Wesleyan Avenue in Barberton. Have a great day.